So in this talk, I'll try to um, address the question that Andreas raised in the last talk. Um, so uh, I'm, first of all, let me uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to this very nice conference. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, top mass determination at the LHC um, using jet grooming. And this work was done in collaboration with Andre Huang, Sunny Mantri, and Ian Stewart. And uh, this is based on this work uh, in this paper. Um, and I'm also grateful to uh, previous speakers, Chris Lee and Daniel, who have uh, laid, already laid some of the groundwork for this talk. So it lessens some of my burden. Um, I don't have to go through the introduction. Daniel already went through it. Um, there are very, so, but let me just mention there are very, various ways of measuring top mass. Um, and uh, so Daniel mentioned the kinematic reconstruction, and it happens to be the most precise uh, and has less than 1% of uncertainty on the top mass. But as we heard uh, in the previous talk, it's not clear what top mass scheme this number corresponds to. And so which means this uh, kinematic extractions, which are the most precise extractions at the LSC, um, they rely heavy on, heavily on Monte Carlo, so there, but there's a little crosstalk between theory. Um, and in the previous talk, uh, Daniel made an attempt to connect uh, this link between theory and simulation, try to understand what is the, uh, can we say something about the, Mo the Monte Carlo top mass parameter? And in my talk, um, in this work, I'm going to try to attack this problem directly. Can we try to come up with an observable that will allow us to extract top mass by direct comparison of theory and data. Um, so, um, so, the, so the demands that, uh, so the benchmark for this work is that we need an observable that is, uh, that is, a kin that is based on kinematic extraction. So um, in the previous slide, I showed you also uh, the pole mass extraction or the mass bar mass extraction from the total cross section. But this is not very sensitive to the shape, um, as you can see. Uh, but an observable that's sensitive, but that makes use of the kinematic final state information uh, is more sensitive to the top mass. Um, so we would like to work with a kinematic uh, observable. And that can be specified in a specific short distance scheme and has that sensitivity to top mass. Um, since Monte Carlo top mass uh, is, a, is something very complex inherently, and as we learned that it's not simply pole mass, and um, it depends on details of the Monte Carlo, such as part and showers and, and others. Um, so we would like to have minimal or no dependence on Monte Carlo uh, when we try to create this link between theory and experiment. And we also demand that this is a program for extraction of top mass at the LSC, so we would like the observable to be robust enough that um, it can... Uh, it can deal with non-perturbative corrections from hadronization and all the contamination from underlying event. I will not talk about pileup, and I trust my fellow experimentalists that they're going to do an amazing job to deal with pileup. Um, and while this is all uh, work for the theorists, there, but the observable, there, this is still a very challenging task because to make a comparison of a theoretical prediction with the experiment, one has to do an unfolding of the data. Uh, which smears the bins, and so one, the observable must retain sensitivity even after the unfolding has been applied. So we are going to use, uh, in this work, effective field theories, as you have seen already in some of the talks before, and jet substructure tools to achieve these goals. Um, so here's the outline of my talk. I don't think it helps for me to read this aloud, um, but, um, but you can see that there are several steps one has to go through to... Um, to get to step seven, which is the hadron level factorization for groomed top, top mass, uh, top jet mass. Um, and it is a complex observable, has various components to it. And you also notice that um, I keep going back and forth between uh, results and calculations for light quarks and gluon jets. Um, because many of these components can be recycled for top quarks. And uh, they are they're simpler to understand for uh, light quark and gluon jet mass where you don't have effects such as decay uh, or the top threshold. Um, and then we will base, uh, we will build up on these results to get to the hadron level factorization. Um, so hadron level factorization means it's a factorization theorem. It's calcula done calculation perturbation theory, but um, it makes a very careful 
Uh, but there's a very careful analysis of hadronization effects that go into it. Um, so, um, so I will heavily make use of these plots. Uh, I call them Z theta plane. And uh, these plots are a very good uh, representation uh, of the, emission, the phase space of all the emissions. So let's say this is a, a parton that initiates my jets, okay? And it emits the gluon. Um, and I'm going to assume that the gluon is soft enough that the, part, the, the quark doesn't recoil, so it, carries, it still has the most of the energy. And um, so I can define relative to the, uh, the, the momentum of the quark, the original quark, I can define the plus and the minus components. So the jet mass of the combined system would be given by this equation. So this will be simply Q times P plus. And, and I will work with this Z and the theta variable. So Z is defined relative to the original jet, which is the energy of the gluon relative to the jet. Um, so that's P minus over Q and the angle with respect to the quark. Um, so if I have a spectrum, so here I'm showing through a spectrum, but a spectrum for jet mass for light quarks will, will look essentially the same. Um, so if I'm in, uh, if I if I look at the thrust spectrum and I in, and in my experiment I find a specific jet mass value here, then that means that um, to the lowest order the emission that came off must lie somewhere on this line. So this line represents uh, all the emissions uh, that will give me the jet mass value mj squared. And so this is in log of z inverse and log of theta inverse. So if I go further out here, I'm reducing the angle, so I'm dealing with more and more collinear emissions. And if I'm going up, the emissions are getting softer. And uh, this is a very nice representation. It'll get more and more complex as we go through the talk. Um, so um, if I go further into the tail region, the blue line moves down. So we go from here to there. And, um, and you see this is the resumed and match calculation that's uh, being compared to the lab data. Um, and to perform resummation uh, in effective theory, we like to separate the modes at the extreme points of the phase space. And so the extreme points of the phase space lie at these boundaries. Um, I can have an emission that is collinear, has an order 1z, so that lies on the x-axis, or I can have an emission that is soft, that has very small z, a very a large angle, but very small z, um, but enough to give me the contribution to the jet mass. Um, and using these modes, in soft collinear effective theory, I can perform resummation and resum logarithms. Um, and, um, but in the talk, throughout the talk, we will also be interested in making sure that we ver understand very well what the hadronization corrections of the observables are. And so how do I understand the hadronization corrections? So you can see that as I go closer to the peak, the prediction starts to deviate from the, from the data, um, and which means the non-perturbative corrections are becoming more and more important. And you can understand that by putting this brown line. So this brown line corresponds to all the emissions that have p squared order lambda QCD squared, okay? And so you can, th you can think of them as non-perturbative modes in effective field theory. And um, as I go to the left, my blue line moves up, and eventually it'll start to come closer and closer to the brown line, and the, uh, the non-perturbative corrections will start to become more and more important. And so it helps to identify what is the leading mode that captures, uh, what is the mode that captures the leading non-perturbative corrections. So in this case, it's, this is the mode that sits at this axis because the contribution to the observable is proportional to P plus. So, and the P plus goes like theta, P minus goes like one over theta. So the mode with the largest angle has the biggest contribution to the jet mass, so it sits here. Um, all of this is nicely captured in a factorization formula here, um, and you have the soft function. And you can see if I move up, it's the green mode that becomes non-perturbative first. So we include the shape function in the soft function. So this is also telling us that the hadronization corrections, um, and they, are, they, they appear in the soft sector, and the collinear sector essentially remains the same. And you'll see this uh, throughout the talk. Okay, and um, for simple observables like jet mass, uh, one can, as we saw in previous talk and before, one can uh, account for these corrections using a shape function. Um, and to a good approximation in the tail region, it only depends on the first moment of the shape function. Very good. Um, now we're interested in the top quark, and so we would like to use um, jet mass um, of the top, uh, uh, of TT bar jet mass, and try to see if we can uh, 
uh, have a sensitivity to the top mass scheme. So I would like to work in the peak region of the top mass, which, which means um, if I look at the jet mass cross section, and uh, I'm interested in the region if this is the top mass value, and because of some radiation, the, the jet mass will have a spectrum, so, but I'm interested in this peak region, which means I'm interested uh, in the scenario where the top is not very off shell. Um, and so for, for this, uh, it's helpful to work in an effective theory, the heavy quark effective theory. So um, this is the heavy quark effective theory Lagrangian that we are all familiar with, we have seen um, in, in, the, in the talks yesterday, but what the difference for top mass is, uh, for top quark is that it decays before it hadronizes. So one includes an extra imaginary uh, width term here. Um, and you see a V here because uh, this is the heavy quark effective theory, but I am looking at boosted tops. So you see an extra V dotted with the covariant derivative, um, which is simply the, related to the boost of the top quark. And in this Lagrangian, I integrated out the pole mass of the top quark to get to the heavy quark effective theory. So I'm trying to describe the radiation that's wiggling around the top quark, but I have to get rid of the mass of the top quark to go to yet smaller scale. But if I were to integrate out some other mass um, in a different scheme that differs from pole mass by this delta M term, then there is a residual delta M term left over. And if this delta M term is of the same order as the width, then I will keep both the terms in my Lagrangian. And any functions, any matrix element I build up using these fields, heavy, uh, using the ultracollinear fields, will eventually have sensitivity to the, uh, the mass scheme as long as mass scheme is of the same order as the width. Um, so if you assume top work is produced to close to mass shell, I can write the momentum like this. Um, so R is this momentum of the gluons and quarks that are wiggling around the top work. And so the jet mass will be given by this. In the peak region, I can drop this term. And it's a, con a convenient variable to work with in the peak region is not the jet mass squared, but a one dimensional variable defined like this. Um, and so the collinear modes that you saw in the pre previous talk, uh, they get integrated out, and the modes that are left over in heavy quark effective theory are the ultracollinear modes, um, and they have the following scaling. So they live at the virtuality of the width, and uh, this is their z, and this is their theta, and the theta is the same as the velocity. So they have the same angle as the, as the top, or the decay products of the top. Okay. Um, so, the, so what happens as a result um, you saw the jet function for the heavy uh, for the top quarks in, in Daniel's talk, and one gets to the jet function by going from collinear modes to ultra collinear modes. And um, but the jet function knows about the width and the mass scheme. So um, um, so unlike previous talk, the width effects are very important, um, and it's also for that reason you will see uh, most of my comparisons later on with Pythia where they have the bright Wigner implemented. Um, so you see you have seen this equation how the mass can be included in the jet function. Uh, including width is uh, not very complicated. You just co convolve with the bright Wigner. But there's a very key assumption that goes into this, is that I am not touching the decay products. I'm being completely inclusive over decay products. And I can ensure that if my top is boosted. So if my tops are boosted, all the decay products are collimated. And if I make a jet that's wide enough, I am going to be, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I'm fully inclusive over all the decay products, which means I can use the full top decay width. Um, and this will play a very important role, um, um, as you'll see in, in a bit. So this leads to a factorization theorem for E plus E minus in the peak region, uh, which you saw in Daniel's talk. Um, and here I'm writing it out. Uh, so, uh, so the soft function that you see here is the same as the one I showed a few slides ago for a thrust. Um, and it's tied to the collinear physics. The only difference is that the, in the collinear sector, it sees the boosted. Uh, it sees the soft momentum, but with this extra boost of Q over M. Um, and uh, we work with the top mass scheme that is of the same order as the width, which means um, MS bar scheme is ruled out because uh, the, the, the one loop correction uh, of this term delta M is, is order 10 GeV from, for MS bar. So that's, that breaks the power counting. Um, also like what, what we saw in yesterday's talk by Ida. Um, uh, so we would like to work with a scheme uh, that is suitable but one can get, define a scheme such as MSR scheme, where, which is the same, which it makes use of the same coefficients of the MS bar scheme, but replaces this R, uh, M bar that sits here by scale R. And by tuning R to order gamma T, we have an appropriate scheme for this observable. 
So this is very nice, but um, this is not still not there for Hadron Colliders. And uh, let me illustrate what the problem is. So this is a spectrum, the jet mass spectrum um, in Pythia for tops with PT greater than 750 GeV. And so green is the parton level spectrum. And so if this is my input top mass um, that I write in my code, um, I see my spectrum is uh, for the parton level is very close to the dash line. Very good, but when I turn on hadronization, the peak shifts, or when I turn off the underlying events, the peak is just very broadly smeared. And so, the, uh, so, so all the beautiful collinear physics that we discussed in the previous slide is just getting washed out by the soft physics. So there is a lot of contamination from underlying event, or there are these non-perturbative effects from hadronization uh, that we need, really need to understand if you want to have a sensitivity to the top mass of order one GeV to compete with the current uh, precision of the top mass. So we would like to work with an observable that is um, more robust um, and does a better job. Um, so I'm going to go back now to the case of light quarks and gluon jets, and I'm going to introduce to you uh, the, the soft drop groomer. So jet grooming, sort of, uh, it, it's a jet substructure. It's a very rapidly growing field. It started about 10 years ago. And um, it may not be familiar to some of you, but let me introduce. So the idea of uh, jet grooming is to take a jet, and I'm given, uh, somebody gives me a jet, which is a collection of particles, and I selectively throw out particles which I consider to be soft, and based on a very precise criteria. Um, and so I'm, I'm given a jet, and I throw out some of the particles. I'm left with some uh, particles after the groomer, after the jet grooming. And I can measure the jet mass on the leftover particles. That would be the groom jet mass. But I want to make sure that the criteria to reject these particles is such that I can still do theoretical calculations for the groom jet mass. And the one achieves that by uh, being careful uh, um, with the, with the way particles are arranged into a jet. So if I'm given a set of particles that form a jet, I will first cluster them based on their angular separation. So you can think of the vertical separation as a proxy for how far apart they're in angles. And so the particles that are closer to an angle, they're clustered first, and then, and then this pair, and then this pair is clustered. So start with particles, so I go to subjets, and eventually subjets get clustered to give me a jet. Then I invert this tree, and I start at the trunk of the tree, and I look at every branch. And if I see that if the branch has the momentum much smaller than the, than the other branch, then I drop this. And what the criteria is, is called the soft drop. It's the soft drop criteria. It's given by this. So I basically compare the energy fraction um, relative to the other branch. And if I find that the energy fraction of this branch is smaller than this number, um, then I drop it. And so the groomer depends on these two parameters, z cut and beta. So if I said beta equals to zero, let, for the moment, let's imagine this term is not there. So z cut is telling you how aggressively I'm grooming. So if I said z cut to 0.2, which means this branch must have at least 20% of the energy share for it to remain in the final groom jet. Otherwise, it's dropped. But if I reduce z cut, let's say to 5%, then, I, then my groomer is less aggressive, and I'm letting even softer brands stay in my final jet, so I can tune. And beta is controlling the angular exponent. Um, and since this number is always less than 1, so this is the angle uh, between the two jets, and the boosted limit is always less than 1. So this is telling you that um, if my beta is positive, so let's forget about the beta less than 0, um, this is just for tagging purposes, but we are only going to consider values greater than zero. So if beta is positive, which means this criteria becomes softer. I reduce this term. So I soften the criteria if I increase the beta. So I'm less grooming less if I'm looking at higher betas. And this criteria came out of, um, after a lot of work into studies of groomers and taggers. And this is a, this is a very special property that it's a IR safe criteria. So if I groom the jet with this criteria, I'm left with a groomed jet um, uh, after having thrown out certain particles. I can do calculations of IR safe observables um, of, this, uh, of the leftover particles. And uh, so, um, OK, let's keep moving. So what happens in jet grooming? So let's consider just the spectrum of massless uh, light quarks and gluons jets. So in this, we have E plus E minus 2 QQ bar dye jets. 
Um, and it's helpful to visualize this in, on a log scale. So jet mass squared over the EJ squared. So the blue curve is what I have if I have simple jet mass, plain jet mass, without any uh, soft drop. So I call this the no SD. Uh, when I apply the jet groomer with these values of zika and beta, you see the spectrum changes dramatically. But what has really happened? To get a better insight, um, we can compare the parton level and the hadron level uh, spectrum in the Monte Carlo. So the dashed is the parton level spectrum. Um, you can see that for very high jet masses, the outermost emission always has enough energy that it stops the groomer right there. There is no soft drop grooming. But as we start to go to lower and lower jet masses, you start to chop out, uh, chop away particles, and you start to see that the jet mass after grooming differs. Uh, but what's very interesting is the parton level and the hadron level are, follow very close to each other for the groomed jet mass and only start to differ at very low values of jet masses. Whereas for the same jet mass, you see a huge difference in the parton and the hadron level. So this is a huge sh correction in the jet mass spectrum from hadronization. So which means this is telling you that this observable is more robust against hadronization. Uh, and only and the hadronization effects become important only at yet smaller jet mass values. So it's a good candidate for jet uh, top mass measurements. Um, and so there's a huge interest in understanding room observables. The partonic resummation is very well understood. So this is the energy energy, uh, energy correlation functions, uh, or similar to jet mass, or the soft drop thrust, or the jet mass after grooming. Um, this was done in coherent branching. These two calculations were done using effective uh, SCET. It has also been measured at the LHC, so I'm showing you the ATLAS result and comparing different predictions in Monte Carlos. And there have been many, many studies with groom, uh, groomed observables, not just the jet mass, but observables that probe the pronginess of the jets or angularities um, uh, for massless or massive jet or heavy quark jets. Um, fixed order pieces have also been calculated up to two loops. And, um, and, we, had, um, and we also uh, did work on um, understanding the non-perturbative corrections, which will also be very important for this, this, this talk. Um, so let me just walk you through what happens for the groomed jet mass. Um, OK. Um, so for the case of groomed jet mass, um, let me try to understand what region of phase space I am uh, removing after jet grooming. So you saw the blue line in the previous, ta uh, in the, previous um, the, the last time I showed you this plot. And so the criteria for jet grooming is that I only keep particles which have z greater than z cut times theta to beta, which means all the particles to below this orange line. And, and so I start from the largest angles and I go in the jet into the core, and at some point I'll find an emission that satisfies this criteria, and I stop grooming, so there's a vertical line here. So I basically chopped out all the particles in this phase space. And you can ask, okay, what are the important modes if I have to understand the partonic resummation of the groomed jet mass? So any, all the jet mass that only makes use of this region of the blue line, that would be from the modes that sit at the extreme points of this phase space. So the collinear mode remains the same, but we are modifying the soft sector. So the soft mode that was here is no longer there. It's been groomed away. And you are left with a mode that is soft, but it's more also collinear. So we call it the collinear soft mode. And this um, soft global soft mode, this basically takes into account of the, uh, this, this captures the effects, the physics of all the radiation that has been chopped out. Um, and so the scaling of this mode is, is given by this. So the zeta is roughly the angle of the collinear soft mode. And the, and the zeta is given by this formula. Um, and it's actually helpful to consider this combination of q and z cut defined by this and beta. Um, because once you using these modes, you can write down a factorization formula um, at the parton level. And the soft function, the collinear soft function that describes this physics of soft sector, it depends on the combination of the, the momentum, soft momentum L plus and Q cut. So it only depends on this particular combination. Um, and uh, so I've been very thorough with the color coding. So the green is here. So this is the effect of all the modes that have been groomed away. Collinear, this is the same jet function that shows up in the ungroomed case because I haven't touched the collinear. Because I start grooming from the top of the, from the periphery of the jet, and then I go inside. So, and usually I stop before I get to this point. Okay, very good. 
and it defines the groom jet radius. The groom jet radius would be the uh, point where um, the soft drop is stopped. It, and that would be the first emission that stops soft drop and that satisfies that criteria. Um, so, so the jet radius, it starts at some value, let's say r equals to one, but after grooming, it's reduced to a smaller cone. So, but for top quarks, if you want to use jet grooming, we have to be more careful. And the reason is that I mentioned that we have to be inclusive in the decay products. Okay, we don't want to touch the decay products, otherwise we will not be able to use the, the same uh, jet function in the inclusive description of the top. We won't be able to use the HQET Lagrangian and put that I gamma term if I am starting to cut into the decay products, which means I can't groom too aggressively. I have to make sure I never touch the decay products, which means that Z, if you do the analysis, I'll get to this parameter H, but for now just um, take my word that this is order of two, and I'll explain the meaning of it. It's related to the angle of the decay products, and this is telling you that I, I should never groom more aggressively than this number, which is set by the width, the top mass, the energy of the top mass, and this number that is related to the angle of the decay products. And this, which means we always should groom, below, we should always be below the blue region. Um, but we also want to groom enough that we get rid of the contamination in the soft sector, so, so you have to groom enough. And this brings you to this allowed region, which we call the light grooming region. So it brings you to this order 1% level grooming. And when you have satisfied this, when you're in this region, you can write down a parton level factorization. So it has the same jet function for the top quarks as you saw in the E plus E minus case, same collinear soft function as you saw in the previous slide for the massless case, um, and almost the same, well, this is a combination of the N you saw in the previous case and the, and the hard functions you saw um, some slides ago for the E plus E minus case. Um, very good. And let me tell you, let me convince you that light grooming is actually very effective. Um, so, sorry, this is not 0.1, we take 0.01, um, so that's a typo. Um, so you, I show, I was harping about this plot. Uh, it's very bad, not good, but if I do jet grooming, um, this is what I have. So you see the shift in the peak is much smaller. In fact, the underlying event curve looks more like just a correction in the hadronization. Um, and the shift is um, order two GeV, order four, two, three GeV. Um, so it's more robust against corrections uh, from hadronization. Um, if at the LSC, I have to construct jets. I can't work with um, event shapes, global event shapes. So I have to uh, construct jets with some jet radius. And the, more, the bigger the jet radius, the more crap I will keep collecting. But with the jet grooming, it becomes very stable. You can also look at the PT veto on additional jets, and it doesn't change. Um, one very interesting uh, result is that before grooming, if I look at E plus E minus and PP, they look very different at hadron level. So this is PP at hadron level. This is E plus so PP at hadron level in the blue, um, and E plus E minus at the hadron level uh, in the green, taking the energy so that they correspond to the same center of mass energy. Um, but after grooming, they come very similar. And there's a factor from, from underlying event which we'll take care of later. So all we need now is a hadron level factorization for groom top jets. Um, but um, you'll see that it's not an easy problem. Um, uh, the hadronization effects in the groom jet mass are very intricate. They actually, they're not a simple shift, even in the tail region, even in the region where you expect the OPE to work. They actually depend on the jet mass. They depend on the clustering history. Um, the amount, the catchment area for non perturbative particles depends on which branches that I have kept. Um, and then there's a question of do, of do these correction, do the hadron level, do the corrections from hadronization, do they depend on Z cut and beta? Or is there any connection between groomed and ungroomed event shapes? Um, and so we had to um, sit down and develop this whole technology and rethink through this uh, problem of non perturbative corrections in the groomed jet mass. So I'm just going to uh, briefly walk you through um, our work on understanding NP corrections to the groom jet mass. Uh, one can do this within the framework effective field theories. Um, and the idea is that, again, now consider the brown, so the brown line is where the non perturbative corrections are important. And, but this mode has been chopped out, so this is the mode that's relevant. Um, and so which means this is the mode that gives me the leading non perturbative correction. But this is stuck to this angle, so which means if I look at a different jet mass, this pink mode will slide up and this mode will slide down. So the angle of this mode is tied to the angle of the mode that stops soft drop. 
So there is a perturbative component to the hadronization correction, which I can actually uh, factor out, which I will do in a few slides. And you can see if I move up in the, in the, in the at smaller jet masses, you'll see that these two modes will merge eventually. And so this is the region where the corrections become order one. This is the region which is the equivalent of the OP region or the tail of the typical ungroomed jet mass. Um, we are interested in this region. Um, and if you look at the uh, light quark jet mass spectrum, uh, the, the, you, can, you can identify the region where the corrections are order one based on this criteria. The idea is that these modes should be well separated, so their P plus should be separated hierarchically for me to be in the OP region, which, me, which means I have to satisfy this condition. Um, in, this condi in, this, in this region, uh, what happens is the guy that stops soft drop has much higher energy than the the non-perturbative correction, the non-perturbative particles, which are the brown ones. So um, imagine this, I had started with these particles and I clustered them and eventually formed my jet and every time I had a recoil. So combining this momenta, the final momenta will be slightly different, but I can make an approximation that in this region, all the, all the branches which are not brown have much, small, have much bigger energy or momenta than the branches that are brown, which means on clustering brown branches with the other branches, I don't change the momenta. So the particles that are kept in the groom jet, the non perturbative particles, are the ones that were part, that were part of the tree that, was, uh, that ended up in the, uh, my final groom jet. So it depends on the perturbative branches that saw, pass soft drop. So this would be rejected because it was clustered with that. Um, and very, uh, at leading log accuracy, you can, you can imagine that the perturbative emissions are angular ordered. And if this is the emission that stops soft drop, all the brown particles that ended up in this cone will get clustered and will be part of my final groom jet and will give me an hadronization correction. So this was gone, uh, and these are also gone. Um, don't worry about the formula. It's slightly technical, but I just want to point out that so the jet mass now depends on the perturbative component plus everything that was collected by the final groom jet and then there is another eff interesting effect for the groom jet mass, which is which something we don't see in the ungroom jet mass. Um, and that has to do with the fact that if I cluster brown particles with this pink mode, um, I change the momentum of the pink mode. And it could happen that if this, was the, if this was the particle that was barely passing soft drop, it could lose a brown particle and fail soft drop, or vice versa. So this lives at the boundary of the soft drop. And we call this the boundary correction. And it only affects, so it affects the outcome of the groom, test of the groomer. And this is the shift correction, which is equivalent to what we have seen in the previous talks for the ungroomed jet. This is basically the stuff that ends up in my final groomed jet. And so these two effects, the shift and the boundary, are important. And um, so the hadronization corrections uh, for the groomed jet mass will look like this. And so there are the non perturbative hadronic parameters. Um, but then you see these coefficients here, and these coefficients are basically accounting for all the angle dependence of the hadronization corrections. Um, and this is nothing like a standard shape function that you saw before. Um, and these you can calculate in perturbation theory. Um, you can compare with parton level uh, Monte Carlo, um, and they agree very well. And, um, and you can use them to get an estimate of what the, how the power corrections from the shift in the boundary term grow as I go to lower jet masses. They go to about 10 to 20%. Um, you can also, I can also convince you that you really do see the geometry that I showed you in the previous plot. You can take the jet mass, divide it into eight bins, and look at the leading non-perturbative subject that has energy less than one GV um, in the CA clustering tree. Get, note its position, and then rescale the angle uh, based on this C1. So, um, I don't have details in to go into how this rescaling is performed, but it's important for the factorization. But you see that this geometry emerges, and it's the soft sector that gets modified, but in the OP region, you see the two overlapping circles. Um, you can fit to Monte Carlo, and it shows that these three parameters that don't depend on any of these Z cut, Q, beta, they describe corrections very well. So now that we understand how the harmonization corrections are to be included, we can use this technology for groomed top jet mass. Um, so we understood, we, so far we, we decided that we want to work in the light grooming region so that we have inclusive treatments of the decay products. 
Um, and the hadronization corrections, they depend on the opening angle of the stopping pair. But uh, for the top quarks, it can happen that the groomer may be stopped by a emission that is, um, that is a simple QCD radiation, like the case for massless quarks or jets, but it can also, be st it can also stop on a decay product. Um, and so these, you can have these two different scenarios. And which means I need to know the angles of the decay products, which you might worry that I'm losing the inclusive description of the decay products, but that's not the case because this is only used, the angle of the decay products is only used to better constrain the hadronization. Um, lots of details, but let me just, so this angle, theta d, is, we can parameterize in terms of h parameter. And H being small, which means the angle is smaller, and I don't see the decay products. But if it's big, then I can stop at the decay product. Um, I'm going to, I'm running out of time, so I have to walk th through this quickly. Um, you can calculate the H dependence. Um, it doesn't affect the threshold. It only, uh, it only, this dependence only enters at the top mass scale. So it doesn't touch the ultracollinear modes. And, um, and so the, it's not a problematic. You can still retain the inclusive description in the jet function. Um, and the same story for soft function. As long as this blob doesn't get big enough, you're, you're doing fine. So in light grooming region, it works out. I'm, there is a, yeah, I don't have time to go into this. The shift correction for the groomed to, uh, top jets in the light course, it looks very similar. Um, and whether I have this angle or that angle, I have to compare the two angles. Um, for the boundary corrections, it only affects if it's stopped by, uh, a, a light gluon, um, but if it's stopped by a decay product, decay products have such high energy, they never get a correction in the soft drop condition in the test. Um, but, but you can show that this correction is suppressed because most of the time in the peak region is the decay products that stop soft drop. So it's this component uh, that is important and I can ignore this extra parameter uh, for the top jets. So I only have to work with uh, the omega one that's coming from the shift. Um, and one arrives at the hadron level factorization formula. Um, it's the same as the parton level, but makes a more careful treatment of the hadronization corrections here. Um, and you can compare the final prediction with Pythia, and you can do a calibration study. Um, and uh, so here we fit for MSR mass with R equals to one, and uh, we fit for this value starting for this Monte Carlo top mass parameter. And we observe this value. Um, and there's some degeneracy in the hadronic parameters and the top mass parameter, um, which you can break by looking at two different PT bins. So this is the hadron level data, and you see that um, you get a value very close to the top mass. I can also turn on underlying event, and what happens is that all the contamination is now absorbed into these hadronic parameter. And the top mass, it only varies by 0.2 GeV, so it's very stable. So we understand how the hadronization corrections are underlying event affects the spectrum. Um, and this is also compatible with the E plus E minus calibration, which Daniel briefly mentioned in the talk before. Um, you can do fit for pole mass. When you do fit for pole mass, you find a value that's 0.5 GeV less. You probably saw this, if you, if you remember, you saw this number also in Daniel's talk. And it's, um, it is related to the extra R evolution that happens uh, from R equals to one to the scale that lives in the peak region. Um, and that brings me to the conclusion. I apologize for going over time. Um, so uh, just to summarize, we use effective field theory techniques and jet substructure to achieve a hadron level of uh, factorization for groomed jet mass spectrum. And this is an observable that's robust against um, corrections from underlying event, for example, and is suitable for, uh, uh, suitable for uh, LHC, top mass extraction. And there's a lot of physics that go into it. One has to do a lot of work to understand the hadronization corrections, but we do now. Um, and it's a systematically improvable approach. And we envisage that uh, in the future, uh, with improvement in the description of the hadronization and the parton level um, uh, factorization, we will be eventually be able to go down below 1 GV. Also, it depends heavily on the statistics uh, from the LSC. So, and that's the, that's the dream uh, of this project. And, uh, and this, I should mention briefly that this omega 1q, the hadronic parameter that shows up here, it's universal. So you can also extract it from light quark and light quark data, so or B quark jets, for example. Thank you.
We have time for a couple of questions. So just trying to understand. So are you saying that uh, if you uh, do this uh, soft drop, then uh, you still, uh, so then, then you could discover the hadronization in this one parameter, omega one, and whatever effect of hadronization can be absorbed into the value of this parameter, so there is no, you don't have to worry about the shape. Effect we do time. actually, if you, if you look at this number, we have this X2, and I didn't have time to mention it, but we consider this as a nuisance parameter, and so we do consider the higher moments, okay, mm -hmm. so, what I showed here that this green is not important, which means it gets rid of the two extra hadronic parameters which are relevant for light quarks and gluon jets, which means the shift is the one that's the major hadronic correction. Um, so in the tail region, you should only see a shift that's related to this omega one. But for the full description, we construct a shape function using this omega one. So the first moment is this, and this shape function is normalized. But then we also include the higher moments. Mm -hmm. And we treat this as a nuisance parameter. And mm -hmm. so this x2 is a dimensionless variable. And it can vary between 0.2, 0 0.7, something like that. And we can see effect of varying this nuisance parameter. Mm -hmm. And that would affect mostly things in the peak. Mm -hmm. I see. OK, thank you. Any other question? If you could go to slide number 12, I have a short question about that. Yeah, here. So if I understand from there, uh, the only effect of the grooming is to change this uh, hard, uh, hard function. And the so, soft function. Ah, there isn't the soft function. So those could be like uh, non-global locks that appear. Uh, no, actually there are no non-global locks for the groom jet mass because once you start grooming away, all the non-global locks sit in the wide angle soft sector, which you have chopped out. So you can show, one can, it has been shown in the original soft drop paper that there are no non-global locks in the groom jet mass spectrum, which means you can consider two top work jets um, in the Hadron Collider, and, and it, doesn't it, doesn't, it depends very mildly on the additional activity in the jet. So, this plot is showing you that I can have additional jets in my events, and I can constrain them by using a PT veto, and the spectrum doesn't change. I can have as many extract additional jets. It isolates the top quark. Okay. Um, so you wrote on your last slide that um, your calibration using PP is compatible with the E plus E minus. Um, um, the calibration uh, done for E plus E minus of the top quark mass. Um, maybe I missed it. I was just wondering how exactly is it compatible? With, compatible? Do you also get out a number which is approximately Yeah, the, the same? numbers match. Ah, okay. The numbers for R equals to one MSR that matches this number that I get here. It also is something that they observe. I see. And, and when I do the pole mass fits, I get a number that's 0.5 GV less. That, all, that is also something that they observe. And what are the uncertainties on, uh, on this number? Yeah, so, that's a, so this is a very preliminary, so this is not as thorough as the E plus E minus calibration, I have to admit. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't want to say a number. I mean, I could say 0.5 GV to 1 GV, but, there's, but we need to do a better job. Uh, this was just a preliminary uncertainty to show a proof of principle that it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we thank the speaker again. Mm -hmm. And I guess we have 20 minutes for the coffee break.